Welcome to Zen Talking Heads. I'm your host and moderator, Myung Jin Unsan. We have three panelists tonight. Uh, Robert Coho Epstein, uh, Wayne Dayan, Bibbins Tatum, and Briar Hangdahl Chita. And... I have some questions, and I'm going to ask them to provide their answers. So, question one. What is Western Zen? All right, I'll jump right in. Thank you. Zen has evolved everywhere it has gone around the world and taken on local flavors as it adapts the medicine to suit the sickness, which can vary in different cultural appurtenances, lineages, or situations while remaining true to the essence and spirit of Zen. Western Zen is a work in progress, still being adapted to the oddities of Western culture and translation of Eastern philosophy. Thank you. Who else would like to weigh in on that? What is Western Zen? I'll, I'll jump in. I, I would just say that everything that Handal said was great. And I would just add that I think it's a, a really interesting and unique characteristic. Three things about Western Zen that's a little bit different than the older traditions. That is a, a much more of an emphasis in Western Zen on lay practice and the integration of Zen practice into everyday life and ordinary social situations. Two, the role of women becoming much more prominent and taking leadership roles, which didn't exist in the old schools. And that's changed the flavor of Zen, I think, in a more well-rounded way. And uh, three, the parallel development of Zen in the West and modern psychology which have had some ways of informing each other so that some of the schools anyway, particularly the lay schools, include more of the work on getting through personal obstacles uh, and working with the self as opposed to just abnegating it. Thank you. Very good. And Reverend Dayan, how about you? Oh, well, I will uh, uh, agree with everything that has been said so far, and I will add uh, um, that Western Zen is ironically the best contemporary um, instantiation of a Western wisdom tradition leading from Socrates down to the present and the uh, ancient Greek philosophical uh, philosophy as a way of life in that it not only has the ethical, psychological, epistemological, metaphysical uh, uh, thought behind it, but it also is a place where people of like minds can congregate together and discuss such things, which is unusual for uh, uh, Western philosophy, but is Zen. And because it's Western Zen, it has that entire tradition behind it, plus an Eastern tradition of philosophy that is coalesced into one uh, modern school. Wow, thank you all. Can I throw another comment in? Sure. Uh, this is bouncing off of what Wayne said. It struck me that the Socratic dialogues where Socrates would try to test and draw out a response on some aspect of truth from the person he was talking to through questioning has some parallel similarity to the way that the, uh, that, the that Chan and Zen masters would ask questions to uh, either the groups or individuals that they were working with to test their understanding and uh, also to bring them further along in the path of insight. Hmm. Sort of like this. Is it different from Asian Zen? And is one more legitimate than the other? Yes, no. <laughs> Moo or Ak. <laughs> Uh, don't know, and all dichotomies are false dichotomies. Very good. You're all very good Zen students, apparently. Um, okay, now we into something a little bit more granular. What about lineages? Do you think they're important? 
Are they even real? I think there's a substantial question going back historically about many lineages and many of the old schools were challenged at some point or another for, for having artificially created them in one way or another. Uh, some schools, of course, their origins are somewhat apocryphal. That being said, there's probably some legitimacy to it. Talking about that, that third leg of the school stool that you just wrote on or legitimizing a student teacher relationship and an ability to to carry on the teaching that there be a continuity where somebody is working with another person or a group of people to establish they sort of maybe kind of know what they are or are not talking about versus just going online and starting a sangha and saying, hey, I'm going to teach you Zen, but it might not really be Zen. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Robert, what do you think about that? Yeah, I personally have a very, uh, a strangely strong attachment to lineage uh, for someone who doesn't really know or follow rituals and rites very closely and doesn't have most of the trappings or accoutrements of someone who is a formal uh, Zen person, but the actual lineage of being able to look back at the line of masters and teachers that led up to what you are practicing and feel a kinship and affiliation and a sense of inheriting what they have passed on uh, is extremely important to me. Uh, the most important part of lineage, though, is not, is that uh, I think it's, you know, at Hangdo, uh, Breyer mentioned that um, the legitimacy of the teaching being handed on directly from somebody who has experienced it to somebody who is practicing it so that they can approach it correctly and, you know, not just get some pseudo or intellectual version of it. And, um, you know, uh, whatever the whatever the lineage is, whether it's um, Rinzai or Soto or one of the Korean schools, each has their own methodology, but each one of them has that connection from one person to the next all the way down the line. And Dayan, how about well, you? Well, I, I, I would agree completely with the continuity and the the passing on from teacher to student is absolutely crucial. And if you need the feeling of of being part of a tradition then the lineage is important uh but at a certain point it might seem just like a a raft that you can abandon once you get to the other shore i've always thought of of lineage as being important in that uh, you're you're not a charlatan like mm -hmm. you could look up your your pedigree papers and see that you actually, you know, are a pure breed, as it were. Um, so Robert brought up something uh, that I'd like to go into now. How about rituals and ceremonies and defined practice forms? Uh, do they matter? Yes. I, I think that there's always a question, and again, depending on your, your view or your school of Zen on how much is maybe putting the energy out there, which energy never stops, versus establishing the practice. But ritual, at the very least, at, at the lowest common denominator, establishes a basis for the discipline of settling in focusing and in the case of a sangha having that community experience of practicing together with with that that portion of the refuge whereas my experience has been when you do away with all ritual because you say oh it's not real anyway there's no there's no real prayer or whatever some zen schools might say you do away with the commonality of practice, you do away with the discipline and you find, you know, anything goes, we'll, we'll munch, chew crunchy granola and meditate later. Um, should I say something or did you have something to say? No, go ahead. 
Okay. Uh, well, I really agree with that. And I think that, you know, uh, some of the rituals, uh, some of them are, and all of them potentially are meditative forms. So when they are utilized that way and seen as ways of promoting presence and mindfulness, then all of the rituals have value. Um, I do, I, my feeling, although I haven't, you know, participated in one of the schools, it's mostly by hearsay for me, that use an enormous amount of ritual beyond what I know, um, that I think there's a possibility of getting lost in the minutia of many, many, many formal rituals that overtake, uh, that can overtake the school and become uh, practicing the letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law. But if you have uh, rituals that form a structure for practice and that remind you of the most important principles, like the things that we chant in this group and uh, some of the, you know, the dedication of merit and some of the reminders of what the practice is about, uh, I think those, and especially the chanting of the Heart Sutra, I think that those are very valuable rituals or practices and that I would definitely, you know, value those. Well, I would just like to speak up on behalf of crunchy granola, which I think is is <laughs> excellent. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm sort of of two minds. I, I Mostly I look at rituals. I mean, I think somewhere the teaching is that's one of the fetters, this attachment to rites and rituals. So ultimately, I think they're not important. And yet I have a certain ritual chants and and other things that I do every day. And that's it, it is a certain grounding in the practice that are they important? I don't know. And yet I do them and they help me. Keep me focused. Great. I think especially for an online setting that we do a little bit more um, ritually things than than a lot of people do. I've seen other sanghas that have some. I think, you know, we're trying to replicate the in-person uh, experience that was part of my practice uh, in person all along and trying to keep that sort of continuity going. And I agree with all of you that the discipline and um, just the grounding, the fact that, that it helps uh, helps us take refuge in the Sangha by taking refuge in the Buddha and the Dharma. So uh, on the subject of practice forms, there are a number of forms associated with Zen. Seated meditation, walking meditation, bowing, chanting, uh, Kung An work, Huadu, um, are any of them any more valid or important from the standpoint of Zen in terms of leading to awakening and also to saving all beings? I used to be very skeptical of of some of them and and you know a, a sort of probably somewhat elitist soto origin in theravada well i'm going to jam myself into posture and sit here for an hour because that's what zen means and that's what we do um i've i've adapted that viewpoint based on a combination of working with other people and trying to figure out their needs and what is helpful to them and also with working with this sangha and the the korean son perspective that embraces more different dharma gates as the one dharma than i had experienced in some other lineages and really looking at it and saying, well, if what this person that is needing help needs right now is to chant Amida Buddha, and that 
provokes a concentration, an awareness, a relief, then who am I to say, well, you're not practicing properly because you should be able to sit Zazen for 40 minutes without moving. So I, I think there's a validity to, again, the, the medicine appropriate for the sickness, the teaching appropriate for the student. Cool. Robert, you're leaning forward. Yes, great. One of my favorite subjects. Um, you know, I was, uh, I've had my main training in Open Mind Zen based in Melbourne uh, with uh, Al Rappaport. And uh, that is an offshoot of Mayazumi's uh, white plum tradition, uh, which is uh, a, a, an amalgam of Soto sitting and Rinzai koan practice. And by having those two together, which uh, obviously the Sambo people, as well as my Zumi, thought was a valuable combination, I've come to value both the Shikantaza kind of very straight uh, sitting, um, special kind of sitting, which is not uh, sitting that's just based on concentration, but is sitting that you could say is based in, in being present, to put it simply for the moment, and then really working with a lot of koans. Um, I would never want to drop either of those practices. I, I think that people who just sit and don't do koan work, uh, if it's really the right practice for them, it may be extremely uh, valuable. And the, you know, the Rinzai tradition and some of the other traditions that just do koan work almost from the beginning, not quite, but do the whole system, mm -hmm. the whole extended system is based on, on koan work and the koan progression. Um, I think that's a very valuable path too. But being able to just sit without a koan and being able to really work on a koan, I think that having both of those capabilities is uh, is really of great value. So you can see what it's like to be quiet and you can see what it's like to work on something that opens the mind. Um, as far as Huadu goes, before I uh, went into this school, I did a couple of years of work on Huadu uh, remotely with a teacher. And um, I think it's just a great practice. I mean, for those who just do Huadu and as their practice for years and never go into koans, I think Huadu in itself can be amazingly uh, mind opening. And so I, th I love all the practices and I think they're all great. Uh, Jay Han, how about you? Yeah, well, I, I, I've, I've tried many practices and, uh, and and many of them have been successful but the, the I mean prior the still the skillful means seems important it's what will work best for the person but in a sense I mean whether they're more important when things all things move among and intermingle without distinction I mean it's whatever works um, very Hawaiian approach there intermingling <laughs> without hindrance <laughs> uh, one of well, my favorite poems as as a uh, as an offshoot of that, Robert was talking about things in terms of um, seated and uh, kong on uh, work. Um, what if, out of all those forms that I mentioned, you didn't sit and you didn't do kong ons? You just did bowing and chanting or or bowing and wadu would you consider that legitimate uh zen practice i think really what would matter is if the person did a practice like that with full commitment and mindfulness and were doing it in order to uh investigate the nature of mind or the nature of self if they had that intention I don't know if bowing by itself, but certainly bowing and wadu. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's possible that it could just be bowing, but that's a little bit of a challenge for me to imagine. But if you were just doing chanting, uh, many of the Chan masters combined uh, uh, chanting uh, with the question, "Who's doing the chanting?" Right. and um, and that turns it, turns it into a Chan practice. So I really think it depends on the intentionality and whether you're really working with the mind or not. Hang doll, how about you?
I would say that for me, it seems not as effective, but that's not a fair judgment for all people. And again, where I where I've changed my mind a little bit, and I, I had this pointed out to me at one at one point by uh, by in was that if if you're helping all beings, and for the the lay person who doesn't have the opportunity to again be this kind of American lay priest thing that that we've evolved into that their practice could be that they they come and chant and bow and that helps them to to live a better way to find zen meditation through through that form then it's valid that's that's what you know the the Masters were saying that for the lay person, that may be the practice that's valid. Maybe not for for a priest or a monk, but who are you to judge if a person finds their solace and their peace with their community through that? A, a real quick one on on what Breyer said, uh, just to say that I would totally agree. And if I was working with somebody who had never meditated before. The first thing I would do is try to find any meditation form, probably breathing meditation, but maybe something else that they couldn't sit and breathe without getting too distracted and upset. A meditation form that they could settle into and have as a starter form so that they would feel comfortable sitting. That would be my first goal. Chanting, whatever it might be. Dan, what about you? Oh, I, I would agree. Well, this is becoming repetitious. I agree with what you guys said. I guess it, it uh, bowing and chanting, they aren't my things, but they're good things if they lead to more wisdom and compassion. Um, Robert, if you've never done 108 full prostrations in the morning, you haven't lived. Of course, the days of even 27 Prostration says that ship has sailed, but uh, I did that... some. I never did 108, but I did some prostrations in the past, and and I enjoyed them. They also, you know, if you do yoga, it's a little easier. At my current condition with spinal stenosis, um, I don't think I could do it, but I would still find it interesting. Yes, that raft has definitely crossed over to the other shore. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we're, uh, we're about ready to wrap up here. Um, there were a few other questions I had, but uh, we can save them for the next Zen Talking Heads episode. Um, how would you describe your practice? And uh, put that in context of uh, a monolithic Western Zen practice, like I, I opened up with, you know, what is Western Zen? Well, is there a Western Zen? And how does your your own practice uh, fit into that? Are you looking more for a description of how we practice or Please, please clarify the question there, Quizmaster. <laughs> <laughs> Quizmaster, yeah, I like that. Um, in terms of, all right, so we we started with what is Western Zen, and we had some, you know, fairly broad definitions uh, that essentially are, you know, it's Zen practiced in the West, and it's evolved, you know, according to causes and conditions and situations and relationships in the West. Do you think that your practice as you do it is um, different in any substantive way than anyone else's practice? I think that my practice is in some ways different perhaps although not in any way that would matter in, in picking and choosing just because 
like everybody, I think in our Sangha, my background is pretty varied. And so I have a practice that's developed over a ridiculously long amount of time through a number of schools. And it's based on what has worked for me and starts with the, an actual daily liturgy form that I follow. Um, but that also I've had to adapt as I've worked with sanghas with this group and, and with people that I work with here and there to make sure it's a practice that can be shared. But yeah, I, I think it like like all masters, really, if you if you go through the lineages again, Eastern or Western. I think we just froze on hangout. Oh, yeah, I think that's right. low in the interpenetration of what we're doing. Yeah, we're we're in Zoom hell for a second there. Uh, we, lost, we lost a lot of that hang doll toward the yeah, end. That probably wasn't important. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Robert. I, I think that um, hang doll brought up something that was important, which is that even in any given specific lineage, while staying true to the basic principles and practices, every single teacher in the in the history of the lineages had their own special device or their own special way of teaching that they developed and passed on to their immediate students. So the lineage grew not just by mechanically passing on a very specific practice with no variations, but by adding something of the individual to it, of the individual teacher, and then passing on those skillful devices to their students. And then some of those would stick and some of them would fall away. So the lineage and the practice is kind of a living being um, that goes on and changes uh, through the different uh, individuals that master it or hope to master it. Um, for myself, I have an eclectic background too, like Hangdao. I studied Tai Chi with four or five different teachers for a number of years. I was a yoga teacher for 15 years. I, studied in a seminary and have a, and, and ordained as an interfaith minister. I did, performed one wedding with that uh, title in my career. <laughs> and, um, and I've also studied uh, mindfulness meditation, you know, the Vipassana style, as well as uh, Zen. And so my, my practice is somewhat eclectic. I'm, I'm one of those individuals who's attracted to all the techniques, so I like to try to practice as many of them as I can. But my main practice is centered in koan, because when you have a koan, it's hard not to focus on it. You have to work with it until you go to the next one. So I've been working with koans for a number of years, and I'd say that's the core. But I really do enjoy also just sitting and seeing to what extent I'm able to just sit and be aware. Uh, I guess my own practice is highly influenced by the path I took to Zen, which is through Western philosophy, uh, existentialism, pragmatism, the Hellenistic philosophers of Stoicism, Epicureanism, and uh, Pyrrhonism, which affect both the mind and the way you think about the world and the way you react to it and your ethical practices. Uh, but my, which, and all of this informs everything I do, but I guess the daily practice is probably walking and Lojong uh, more than anything. Those two, because it's all the time. Every, I mean, Lojong is something I do all the time. Uh, and of course, I mean, sitting and I mean, all the other forms of meditation are useful, but those are the two that are, are always there for me. Yeah. I would say in general that the concept of Western Zen is um, one of those generalizations that people sometimes fall into making and uh, it's an absurd statement and uh, you know beyond defining it as Zen as practiced in the West uh, it's, it's just silly. 
there's no monolithic Asian Zen either. I mean, from country to country, you've got Chan, you've got San, you've got, you know, Soto and Rinzai in, in Japan, and you've got Tien in uh, Vietnam. And I'm sure going from one temple to the next in those places, as you've said, there's going to be differences and there's going to be differences from teacher to student, and each student has his own individual background. Um, and they bring something to the table, and then they leave other things uh, behind. Uh, as Sang Dao has been saying, it's a what does the uh, student need? What illness does the medicine, whatever it might be, need to treat? And with that, we'll wrap up uh, tonight's special edition of uh, Zen Talking Heads. And thank you for participating.